All right, uh, it's one o three. So I think uh, I think by the time that we go over the introductions, then we should be good. Um, so hello and welcome everybody to this uh, August uh, Home Dialysis Journal Club. We represent the ISPD Central Time Zone uh, Journal Club. Presenting today is one of our second year fellows at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Dr. Russell Long. Uh, Russell did his uh, medical school at Michigan State University and did his residency at Beaumont Hospital. And uh, today, Russell is going to be talking to us about a very interesting um, article uh, titled Preliminary Safety Study of the Automated Wearable Artificial Kidney, or AWAC, in Peritoneal Dialysis Patients. So without further ado, Russell, take it away. All right. Um, thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Dr. El Shami. Um, so, like Dr. El Shami says, I'm Russell, one of the nephrology fellows over here at Vanderbilt. Um, I'll be presenting on the automated wearable artificial kidney. So, this is a preliminary safety study, um, as the title says. Um, and besides presenting on some exciting technology, uh, one of the reasons I chose to present on this study is actually it came out of Singapore. And for those that don't know, um, I'm actually from Singapore. I spent a lot of my growing years there. Um, but besides growing up in Singapore, I really don't have any other disclosures um, to make. Um, and this this picture is the beautiful skyline of Singapore. If nobody's been, it's an amazing, amazing country. All right. So getting into the uh, agenda for today, um, we're going to be talking a bit, just, just spend a few minutes just talking about the history of dialysis, um, the challenges of single pass models uh, with HD today um, with the, and the kidney, um, and then we'll delve into the nuts and bolts of uh, what AWOC actually is. That's how I pronounce it, Dr. I'll show you AWOC. I don't know if it's, it's correct or not. Um, but anyways, um, and then we'll get into the preliminary data um, of the study itself and then have some closing remarks um, that the future really is now. So in the next four to five slides, um, I'm going to very briefly start with a bird's eye view on the history. Now, this isn't a history lesson per se, um, but because I think if we're going to talk about wearable, um, portable artificial kidney, I think it's important to acknowledge how far technology has come in the giants of nephrology that preceded it um, and made this really possible. Um, as the saying goes and as the picture illustrates, um, we really stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, and before we know it, who knows, maybe we'll be walking around with some implantable chips doing dialysis for us one day. All right, so this is a really cool table I found. We're not going to go into to BC um, dialysis modalities, but I will say that even starting in the 1500 BCs, it's pretty interesting that hierographs depicted leeches being used to suck blood, um, which they noticed didn't uh, coagulate. And then as early as 150 AD, it was formally recognized that the kidneys produced urine. Um, as early as the 1800s, um, scientists did recognize that urine contained large amounts of urea, uh, which may be toxic if not excreted. And then the first good semi-permeable membranes that was um, being used uh, became developed around that time. And later in the ensuing decades, um, some of the major works and theories of diffusion and dialysis was developed. But it wasn't really until the 1940s that modern dialysis was first described. Um, Dr. Kolf is considered the father of dialysis. And he constructed the first dialyzer back in the 1940s. Um, but really, he started in the 1930s experimenting with sausage skins, uh, orange juice cans, uh, washing machine, and other common items to make a device that could clear blood of toxins. Ultimately, he came up with this machine here, uh, which is considered the first modern drum dialyzer and it remained the standard of uh, care for the next decade or so. This was further modernized um, at the Brigham by uh, Dr. George Thorne. Um, leading to the manufacture of a uh, stainless steel uh, Kolf Brigman um, kidney, which, which paved the way for the first kidney transplants later in the 1950s. These dialyses at that time also became instrumental in the treatment of acute renal failure in American soldiers in the Korean War. Um, but having said that, these dial dialysis units um, that consisted of twin coils of tubing were disposable, and it wasn't really initially meant for chronic maintenance renal replacement. The idea of maintenance dialysis came about in the 1960s um, at the University of Washington, Washington, where uh, Dr. Scribner and Dr. Quinton introduced the Teflon shunts. At that time, Teflon was being used um, around pacemaker wires because it was uh, tolerated in tissues. So they would insert these Teflon tips into purple blood vessels and then join them by this metal crimp uh, rings to silastic tubing uh, connected to each other by this U-shaped device um, that you see here. This allowed blood to be shunted 
uh, from the tube in the artery back to the tube in the vein, and it allowed the patient to get dialyzed without making new incisions every single time. Obviously, as you can see in the picture here, um, the Scribner shunt was, was external, um, so it very commonly became infected, especially in those that didn't have very good hygiene. Um, over time, they got rid of the metal supporting plate, and this became the new standard vascular access until in the late 1960s, when AV fistulas made the external Scribner shunts essentially obsolete. This is my last slide on dialysis history, and um, Scribner wasn't really done quite then. Um, you see, interest in home dialysis modalities began in the early 1960s, and why shouldn't it? Shouldn't it? I mean, and it may allow patients normalization of their daily routine and perhaps affect their quality of life. And we'll come back to this a bit uh, shortly when we talk about AWOC and the potential advantages that you could see from having an automated wearable um, uh, kidney. Um, this is a picture of the first Seattle home peritoneal dialysis patient. And as you can see, they're hooked up to this 40 liter glass carboy um, that held the sterile dialysate um, and dialysate outflow. Um, something interesting for the fellows to know, and I didn't know about this too, um, is that before KT overview was developed, um, dialysis adequacy was measured by something known as a dialysis index. Um, Scribner, um, at the time of PD, noted that PD patients would experience um, peripheral neuropathy a lot less commonly than patients on HD. Um, so he developed this relationship of surface error and hours of dialysis or clearance of middle molecules. So the dialysis index then took essentially into account the body surface area, um, the residual renal function, vitamin B12 clearance, the, mem the peritoneal membrane itself, and the uh, ultrafiltration. So we fast forward into today's landscape. As we know, um, growth is continuously outpacing the capacity of kidney replacement therapy. Um, this nice graphic from back in 2019 that presented at ISN shows the global prevalence of chronic dialysis in the world. The right side of the graph um, shows the estimated worldwide need um, and the projected capacity of uh, kidney replacement therapy by 2023, which is this year, I believe. So by the numbers, I guess worldwide, uh, 4.7 million patients are on dialysis back in 2021. Um, of those 4.7 million, 89% were on HD, 11% on PD. And then in terms of the availability of these modalities in the 125 countries that are surveyed, 96% um, had availability to HD and 75% to PD. Now, I don't think anyone in this room here or anybody listening, listening virtually would ever deny that dialysis saves lives but it's also a considerable burden of, for patients. And it's easy sometimes for the learners in the room, myself included, um, to place patients in dialysis and essentially call it a day. Um, I think it's very important for us to take a step back and recognize the impact that we have on their quality of life, um, whether it's transportation, the social aspects, the financial aspects, um, the, the effects we have on the autonomy, and even on their mental health. And these aspects are sometimes really difficult to measure and quantify. This study here um, was done about 22 years ago. Um, it was a two-year study that essentially looked at the physical and mental impacts of patients on hemodialysis. It was measured by a health survey on the quality of life um, and functional status. It's reported here um, on the y-axis, you can see the physical component score and um, the mental component score in the graph on the bottom right. Um, and then the chronic conditions being on the x-axis. So as you can see, the physical component scores were significantly lower in the dialysis patients, um, even more than those with pre-existing limitations on their mobility. And then the mental uh, component scores um, were also lower in the majority of uh, chronic conditions, including cancer and heart failure, with the exception being depression, um, having a lower score. But I think there's something to be said um, that you have to be clinically depressed um, to have scored lower than those patients on dialysis. But it's not just a quality of life um, issues that uh, are problems with current um, dialysis modalities, in particular of hemodialysis. When we look at functional differences of the native kidney and HD patients, we know that the kidney removes waste at a native kidney, anyways, removes waste at a continuous state. So you maintain urea, for example, at a low steady state. Um, and patients on HD, um, this is a seesaw pattern of removal, um, which our bodies were not really evolutionary uh, prepared for. So a 12 hour uh, weekly HD um, schedule for a patient effectively leaves an ESKD patient azotemic, uremic, and often fluid overload of the remaining 156 hours of the week. Another major difference between our kidneys and current dialysis modalities is a quantitative and qualitative removal of uremic toxins. 
unlike the natural kidney, none of the current artificial kidneys have the capability or anyways effective capability of removing significant amounts of middle molecular weight and the protein bound solids. So this forms the premise, I guess, and the impetus of AWOC. Um, the device aims to essentially address the functional differences between the native kidney and kidney replacement therapy, the clearance of middle molecules, and the uh, impact and burden of dialysis on patients, um, not necessarily in this order, and hopefully um, each one for the better. This is a statement uh, issued by one of uh, the American presidents in the 2019. I'm um, not going to go back who it was, but Right, he said, right now, only 12% of patients in dialysis receive care at home. My executive order will change that. And obviously, as we, Gilda and I learned in NDLU, um, val um, with value-based care becoming the forefront of medicine, there is a great push for home dialysis modalities. And the future really is not tomorrow, it is today. And that gets us into what is AWOC. Um, AWOC is, I mean, it stands for essentially the Automated Wearable Artificial Kidney. It's about a two kilograms to four and a half pound um, PD device that is sorbin based. And we'll go over what sorbin based is because I had no idea what it was. Um, and it utilizes tidal PD technique for continuous 24 hour regeneration of dialysate. Um, the device can be worn in the hip, as you can see in the picture over there. And in the next few slides, we're going to talk about how all of this works um, before evolving to the study itself. Single pass HD, which is what this um, very basic model shows, is currently the most common uh, kidney replacement therapy in America, as I have emphasized several times. Um, a typical four hour HD session will use around 120 to 150 liters of dialysate. Um, so, I mean, that's why we have whole water treatment rooms in dialysis units, and also why our unit has been, units have been traveling 600 cc per minute dialysate flow rates for resource management. Now, obviously, someone can't really carry around 150 kilograms of dialysate around unless you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, but in order to make dialysis portable, we then need to somehow create some sort of closed loop system that continuously regenerates the small volume of dialysate. These are all the um, uh, different strategies that have been proposed or are being developed um, currently, at least this was back in 2008, so obviously more progress has been ma made. Um, but we'll be focusing on the wearable um, PD portion that I highlight in the green down there. I drew this myself. Um, so this cycle here is a very basic overview schema of how AWOC regenerates dialysate. Um, it starts off with um, you instill it into the patient, and then you have enzymatic hydrolysis. So basically, urea, urease catalyzed hydrolysis of urea and ammonium and bicarbonate. Um, ammonium, as you guys know from Amphogel and, and your ammonium-based deodorants are even more toxic than urea. Um, so there has to be a system to remove ammonium. Um, that's where the Ready, uh, which stands for Recirculating Dialysis Sorbent System, comes in. Um, by AWOC company words, a sorbent is essentially a material that binds another substance or compound to it by physical and or chemical reaction. So in this case, um, AWOC uses uh, zeichronium phosphate to bind ammonium. However, the chromium phosphate also inadvertently uh, removes calcium, magnesium, and potassium ions from dialysate. So in AWOC, there has to be a separate reservoir within the machine itself um, of all these three ions um, to reinfuse into the dialysate. Um, and to be clear, even though I'm talking about this like this is new to me, and I'm, I don't know if you guys have learned about sorbent technology, um, sorbent technology isn't ex exactly brand new. Um, it's been around since really the advent of single pass dialysis, but the cost differential at that time um, heavily, heavily favored single pass systems um, paired with reverse osmosis water purification. So by the early 1990s, sorbent um, dialysis essentially disappeared from clinical use, and now there's a, been a bit of a resurgence into it. This table here is actually the supplemental table from the study itself. Um, it shows the different sorbent compositions and what they're actually removing. So like I mentioned, there's a chromium phosphate removing uh, ammonium, but obviously, as you can see on the right, it's removing your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium. Um, there's also a hydrogen chromium oxide um, component, which is using ion exchange as well to remove uh, phosphate and heavy metals. And then you have your activated carbon component, which is removing organic uh, contaminants, and then urease, which is uh, causing the hydrolysis of urea into ammonium bicarbonate. 
This is a paper that was done again back in 2008, where the investigators looked at the chemical composition of a regenerated um, dialysate and commercially available um, dineal, um, and they found that they were pretty similar in composition. Um, in fact, um, if you look in the table here, the regenerated dialysate ex vivo um, and the uh, sorbent technology and the regenerated one um, had a more physiological pH of about 6.5 to 7, and they contained bicarbonate as an anion as opposed to things like lactate and acetate, um, which is not unexpected from the urease reaction that I uh, mentioned earlier. And, and we'll come back to, in the discussion part of paper, we'll, we'll talk a bit about why maybe that's important for us um, with the peritoneal membrane. All right, so this is the, well, let's take a closer look at what the AWOC device actually is that AWOC Technologies made. So again, it's a title-based uh, system and it consists of this controller and disposable cartridge. Um, the, the cartridge contains the infusate reservoir and that absorber system that contains the sorbents. So there are three big phases to remember, and I'm gonna repeat this later on in the study again, but essentially there's the initial fill phase, the outflow phase, and the inflow phase. So you do that initial fill on the patient, and then you connect the device to the patient. Then you prime the system with about 125 cc's of dialysate drawn from the patient. Then it goes into the outflow phase. So after priming, the therapy removes about 250 cc's of fluid from the patient, and it goes into the storage module using a negative pressure. That's why it's called outflow. Um, this dialysate then passes through the absorber system that contains sorbents, um, and then urea is hydrolyzed here with ammonia, uh, carbon dioxide, and along with the calcium, magnesium, potassium I mentioned earlier. They all get removed through absorption and ion exchanges. And then you go into your inflow phase. So the clean dialysate um, then gets mixed with calcium, magnesium, and glucose from the infusate reservoir, and it returns to the patient using, using positive pressure. That's why, hence, inflow. And this all occurs continu continuously at two liters per hour. So one disposable cartridge, and this is important to remember for the study, but one cartridge performs about seven hours of therapy. So in essence, if you're going at two liter per hour rate, you generate about uh, 14 liters of fresh dialysate. At the end, at the very end of therapy, the patient attaches this drain bag and then it drains all the dialysate and then disconnects from the device. And then again, this should be kind of done every seven hours. And we'll talk about the protocol of the study itself later. Um, this was actually a study I found from 2018 from Dr. Solani actually wrote this, I think part of her fellowship requirements. Uh, but this is a redrawn schematic um, for, uh, from her. Um, I won't go through the entire process again, but it's just another way of uh, looking at it. Um, potential advantages and benefits of AWOC include that A, it's bloodless. Um, it also has a, a high accumulative flow into and out of the peritoneum, so potentially resulting in improved clearance compared to our conventional PD. So importantly, it results in a cranium clearance of about 30 cc's per minute, not to a normal GFR. Um, also, you're using smaller dwell volumes, like I mentioned, so it may reduce pain, maybe reduce hernia, um, also reducing cost and burden of large dialysate um, volumes. Um, and then obviously, because you're using less volume, so you're going to save on the cost of it, um, like I mentioned, and then um, the need to dispose uh, large quantities of it. And then ideally, um, since it is portable, um, it also provides dialysis on the go, go and um, perhaps can be better integrated into the patient's lifestyle. Um, this is a pay, uh, table that proposed cost comparisons um, of between sorbent dialysis and conventional HD. Um, and based on the business model um, that reimbursement is headed towards um, value-based care um, and, and savings on overheads and costs of in-center HD, I think the astute physician these days um, may, uh, may, may save more using home dialysis modalities through either CKCC or ETC models. Um, some challenges that are important to um, highlight um, is, number one, with all dialysis machines, whether it's HD, whether it's PD at home that, as we do it currently, there's a lot of audio and visual cues that you get from it. So I guess the question that we don't have is, will this be intrusive on a patient's um, daily activities? For example, the patient's in a meeting and they're doing their portable dialysis and the machine just starts going off and alarming. Is that intrusive? Um, the, uh, the component um, replacement timing, like I mentioned, is every seven hours that the cartridge needs to be replaced and in the bladder reservoir, um, they can be replaced at longer um, intervals, but it requires emptying when full, obviously. And then so the patient's going to have to carry more than one battery pack um, for the most part. Um, there's also a question about peritoneal membrane dysfunction. It's not necessarily unique to AWOC per se, 
Um, but it's more a comparison to other portable forms, including the current artificial kidney projects right now. Um, I will mention, like I said earlier, that there is that study that looked in 2008, um, there is a more physiologic pH and there's the presence of bicarbonate in the peritoneum too. Um, and it's no, those are known to be, um, to improve the preservation of uh, the function and integrity of the peritoneal membrane. Um, and then number four, you know, long-term zirconium use. Um, I, you know, it's, it's uncertain, but we have been using decades of uh, 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 increasing use of zirconium compounds in medical practice and hasn't really been associated with clear evidence for its toxicity. Um, I will mention that old cartridges that they used to use in this sorbent technology, um, it used to spill a leak zirconium into the peritoneum, um, but it hasn't been reported with the newer cartridges that they've been using in the last few years. Um, and then number five, Continuous PD catheter use, like I mentioned, this is continuous. You're doing it three therapies, seven hours, 21 hours, essentially in a day. Um, and AWOT can be ran through with either a double lumen catheter or two single lumen catheters. And the consequences of using a peritoneal um, catheter for essentially continuous fluid exchange is not really known at this time. Um, so it remains to be seen how the change in connections and how the regenerated um, dialysate will affect the risk for peritonitis, hyperglycemia, membrane failure and encapsulating um, peritoneal sclerosis compared to traditional um, PD. All right, um, I don't know if this will actually play. I don't think it will, um, but, oh, maybe it will. So I, I, I swear I don't have any stock in AWOC, um, but this two minute is very brief, like minute and a half video um, on their website summarizes um, really nicely what my previous 10 slides said um, before we get into the paper. And I did skip ahead um, the first minute just to get there. Um, I don't know if it'll play. If it doesn't, we'll skip it. Gives me time to uh, drink water too. Oh, I, th I think this part, even if it plays, we might have to uh, uh, cut it out of the recording because it's technically now officially advertising a product. I know we're discussing the paper. Sounds good. I think I now didn't we're kind of cro crossing the line a little bit. But yeah, sounds good. I didn't I didn't play it, but um, essentially it's just summarizing how AWOC works and everything. So um, if you guys have any questions about how it works throughout the presentation, just let me know and I'll give you a quick reminder here. All right, so now that we have the basics of how sorbent technology and dialysis works um, and the potential advantages and challenges to it, challenges to it, let's get into the paper itself. So this was a single arm, single center um, pilot cohort study that was done at Singapore General Hospital. Um, it was done between 2016 to 2018. Um, the eligible patients were between 21 and 80 years old, and they had to be on PD for more than three months. There's a whole host of exclusion criteria here that you can see. I highlighted the ones that um, I thought were important, um, things like peritonitis and acute infections, because obviously that can affect the transport. Um, status of your peritoneal membrane and in psychiatric con conditions, um, something that can be overlooked, but um, important also because we want the the study wants the patient to complete the the whole AWOC um, protocol effectively. So the primary outcome um, that they were measuring was serious adverse events. Like I said, this was a preliminary safety um, study. Um, and then they also looked at completion of nine full AWOC therapies per participant without any device deficiency. Um, secondary outcomes were uh, achieving, uh, measuring the efficacy of it. So achieving KT over V um, over 1.7 and then comparing small middle, middle molecule levels um, pre and post AWOC therapies and then looking at other AWOC events as well. So again, nine AWOC therapies are essentially going to be three days of three complete seven hour um, therapies. Um, the study device itself, um, I kind of went through it, but just as a recap, initial fill, 900 cc's, you have your priming outflow that goes through the sorbent, the infusate reservoir, and the inflow phase, and at the end, attaching the drain back and draining all the dialysate. Uh, fill volumes were increased about 1.5 to 2 liters, depending on what their usual fill volumes were before the study in cohorts 2 to three, two and 3. Um, and then tidal volumes effectively remain the same. And we'll talk about different cohorts, I think, in the next slide or the, second, the next two slides. In the second, the next slide. Anyways, this is the protocol. Um, I kind of tried to draw a timeline of what they were doing. Um, so they would continue their usual PD um, therapy and do a final fill at least four hours before um, starting the study, commencing it. Um, and then they would go through three days, like I said, of seven hours, three times of each cartridge. Um, and then that 
after the third day, they would resume their original PD prescription and continue it throughout into month one. Every week, they'll be getting labs, weekly phone calls. And then during those three days of AWOC itself, they will get labs prior to, and then they'll get their dialysate samples before and the end of um, AWOC, and then measure their weights, their vitals, and then ask a questionnaire about like their, their adverse events. Um, and then from the dialysate sample itself, um, because they're collecting it, they, they looked at endotoxin levels and also cultured the, the samples itself. And then the way the their adverse events was measured, they used just a numerical scale out of 10 um, for things like abdominal pain or discomfort. Um, and then blood pressure that were considered high was above 160 over 90 in two consecutive readings. Um, their, their way of estimating efficacy was essentially using a KTO review. And then um, this was the weekly KTO review was obviously extrapolated because they only did three days. So 21 um, therapies essentially. So they would multiply their average KTO review by 21. So it's a seven um, days of three therapies each day. Sample size was calculated based on achieving a weekly KTO review over 1.7, having a power of 80% and alpha 0.05. Um, they estimated that they would need about 14 patients to reach this, but they ended up recruiting about 17 patients to account for a 20% dropout rate. They did analysis on all patients that did at least one AWOC therapy, and then they did a sensitivity analysis on, all, on patients who only completed all nine AWOC therapies. So this was the recruitment flow chart. Um, two patients um, withdrew. Uh, one developed a cardiac event prior to, and then one from personal reason. So in total, 15 patients were included into the analysis. And then with the cohorts, I mean, numbers are really small, small, um, but the cohorts listed down below there. These were the different configurations. And essentially, effectively, you can think about it as configuration one was cohort one, two was cohort two, and three was cohort three. Um, the, in the early phases, and the reasons why they had these different cohorts is because in the early phases of the study, there was a lot of clogging of the device that was observed. Um, and the device design had to be altered, um, including a change in sorbent composition, as you can see below there. Um, they had to change also the mechanical pressures and the fill volumes to try and address these issues. Um, initially, they thought that it was because of um, all the carbon dioxide production that was happening that was causing inflow clogging. Um, so they tried to increase the uh, pH of the dial state um, to reduce gas from prior therapies with the next cartridge. And this, this seemed to allow for better flows anyways. Um, they also tried to, to reduce the amount of um, reuse dial state um, from the prior therapies. Um, and for the next cartridge anyways, and it seemed to help anyways. So as you can see, the fill volumes changed for cohorts two and three. So like I said, between one and a half to two liters based on what they were filling before. Um, and it, but in essence, the dwell times for all three cohorts were the same and the tidal volumes were the same as well. And in cohort two, had this additional sorbent called di diatomaceous earth. I'm, I'm, I tried Googling it and trying try to figure out what it was. Um, and maybe we can talk about in the discussion if anybody listening knows what it is. But the only thing I could find was that it was a very low cost source of silica. Um, but that was about it. These are the baseline characteristics of the participants. Again, the numbers are very, very small, so it's difficult to do comparisons across the group. Um, since this was conducted in Singapore, the majority of participants were Chinese. Um, they were also mainly male, and the majority of them, um, as you can see, had some form of preserved renal function. Um, so getting into the results, so the primary outcome being the adverse events um, that they observed in these uh, group of patients, um, there wasn't any serious adverse events that were reported using AWOC. Um, the abdominal pain was very, very commonly reported in 60%, 56% uh, of it being during the drain phase, 33% during the inflow phase, and then only one patient during the dwell. And then for the majority of them, um, they did resolve spontaneously. Um, there were a number of patients that also reported high blood pressures, meaning over 160 over 90. Um, and you know, the authors postulated, and we'll talk about it a bit more later, but they postulated maybe it's because of anxiety, maybe pain, with the new um, treatment, uh, uh, the new um, uh, modality of being AWOC, uh, but also maybe because of insufficient UF, um, which we'll talk about. Um, the effluent endotoxin levels were below detectable limits and the cultures effectively showed no bacterial growth. In regards to the efficacy of how AWOC therapy did, overall 15 participants did about 131 AWOC therapies and only 95 out of 131 were valid therapies. 
um, completion of all nine, meaning no issues, and they did every single therapy. Um, cohorts one and two had nothing, and then about 64% from cohort three. And then one participant from cohort one um, effectively didn't complete any valid therapy, so they couldn't calculate any um, sort of KT over V or anything at all. Um, this graph here shows the estimated weekly KT over V um, with AWOC um, in the three different cohorts. Um, as you can see, the one patient from cohort one, um, well, you can't see it here, but one of the patients from cohort one anyways, uh, wasn't included here. Um, the median weekly KT over V was estimated to be about three, and then the interquartile range was between 2.2 and 4.8. This is looking at the uh, middle mole uh, molecule clearance. Um, as you can see, there were significant reductions in um, serum urea, creatinine, uh, phosphate and beta-2 microglobulin levels um, post-AWOC. Um, they did do sensitivity analysis of the participants who completed nine therapies, and it showed very similar results, except that the beta-2 microglobulin was not significantly reduced with AWOC therapy. Serum electrolytes, at least, um, were comparable pre- and post-AWOC. Um, interestingly, I thought um, the bicarbonate um, levels wasn't higher post-AWOC. Uh, but importantly, if you look at the sodium, um, the, uh, the sodium remains similar um, post-AWOC since higher, as, as you know, dialysate uh, sodium concentrations can be associated with hypertension and weight gain between dialysis. Um, and higher post-dialysate sodium had previously been a concern for sorbent dialysis as sodium is added as an exchangeable ion from the adsorbent uh, column to the dialysate. In regards to fluid balance and how ultrafiltration went in AWOC, um, the median UF um, by AWOC in the four annual patients is about 39.6 cc's per hour. And then when patients, the 10 patients who had some form of residual kidney function, um, they actually had a net gain um, in, uh, in uh, fluids of about 25 cc's per hour. Um, however, they, they, when they measured their body weights pre and post AWOC, um, there wasn't a very significant um, change in their body weights. So the takeaways that I got um, from the results, at least from this study, is that A, number one, there is no serious side effects from AWOC. Number two, um, AWOC did achieve that minimum KT or V of 1.7 or 3 therapies per day. Um, number three, clearance was achieved for small middle molecules. Number four, resorption occurred in patients with residual kidney function. Um, and See, and we'll talk about this in the next slide, actually. I have a slide about it. Um, and then number five, um, uh, quite a vast majority of them had, um, had a abdominal discomfort. And, and that's a challenge with sorbent technology. As I said, um, CO2 is released as a byproduct. So there has to be a degasser in the system. Um, so the bloatedness may be just be related with to uh, insufficient degassing of carbon dioxide during the therapies. Limitations of this study. Um, so the way they estimated KT over V, um, they, they calculated it based on the concentration of urea in the final drain. Um, so they're obviously making some assumptions. This, this does lead to some inaccuracy in estimating um, the KT over V compared to those who are on conventional PD therapy, because there's a possibility that there's some non-uniform mixing um, and the actual amount of urea absorbed by the sorbent um, wasn't actually able to be uh, measured accurately anyways. Um, number two, that was, as I mentioned, with all the cohorts um, and the device configurations, there was, um, there was quite a bit of device dysfunction, which resulted in protocol modification. Um, one of the reasons when, I, when we went from the takeaway, how the patient's residual kidney function had actually a net gain in fluid, um, one of the potential explanations is because that might have been because of a lower dextrose concentration in the regenerated dialysate. Um, glucose is being dosed every cycle, and since device clogging occurred um, during the AWOC therapies, like I said earlier, all these prolonged cycles essentially led to reduced dextrose concentration and possibly resulted in, in having a low dextrose concentration in the peritoneum itself, um, hence the net gain in fluid. And then um, there wasn't a, they didn't actually measure any strict dyes and those patients weren't required to report that. Um, but I guess I, you could say that their body weights remain pretty similar pre and post um, uh, AWOC therapies. Um, and then obviously, I mean, this is a preliminary study, um, so sample size um, obviously is an issue and the generalizability of it all since this was single center um, done in Singapore, mainly um, Chinese patients. Um, 
this study is actually now ongoing and they're they're recruiting looking at the late feasibility of it to to look more specifically at the safety and efficacy and more specifically the efficacy of it um so it, it is ongoing right now in uh singapore i think they just announced it uh last month i think um this table i stole from dr salani again um that is kind of looking at um all um some of the different comparisons between a walk and uh, the the artificial kidney um project and i think i think that's it actually from from my side of things um i'll open it up to uh questions and discussions and if anybody knows what diametoshius uh earth is um russell so thank you very much for uh, a great presentation um before we delve into discussion, I, I want to make sure that we kind of um, drive the discussion in a way that is consistent and conducive, because I think that there's a lot to discuss when we're talking about this. So first, I want to focus on the medicine, right? So let's talk about from the medical side of things, electrolytes, ultrafiltration. And then afterwards, let's talk about, you know, the um, cost and um, uh, how uh, practical we think this is in terms of the use. Um, so, uh, you know, from for I'll start with you, Russell, from your perspective, right? How do you think the WAC, the, a, the AWOC, sorry, performs uh, for uh, in terms of uh, managing patients' electrolytes and UF? And would you be interested if you had a patient who's starting dialysis to put them on? Yeah, I think um, so. So, like I mentioned, there were quite a bit of limitations to this study. Um, the the big one was actually the the device dysfunction and then causing that lower dextrose concentrations um, in the peritoneum. So, whether they could actually effectively say that um, there wasn't any effective UF um, in those patients, it's hard to say um, because it's hard to say, hey, if everything went well, would they have have a, a good UF and whether they would actually get fluid off the patients. Um, because obviously a lot of these patients also, like a quarter of them had high blood pressure too. And, and was that because of insufficient UF? You know, I, I don't know if I can comment um, on the UF uh, adequacy um, for AWOC specifically um, right now as it stands. Um, in regards to the electrolyte side of things, um, I think based on that table, at least from what we could tell, it was, it was pretty similar um, uh, pre and post AWOC um, in terms of keeping um, things like potassium down, bicarbonate stable. Um, it had it achieved pretty good clearance, um, at least from what they were measuring. So um, I think it definitely needs needs a larger sample size and and the device actually like functioning like twenty four seven uh, for it to make a good comments on a lot of these questions. Okay, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, from my understanding, at least uh, the point with the dextrose concentration being below, um, you know, what's uh, what's prescribed. In this case, it's theoretical. Of course, they haven't, they didn't really check it uh, there. But I would assume it would be for patients who are using cyclers, right, who are UFing, and then you know you infuse, let's say, 1.5 percent, 2.5 percent. What's coming out is not going to be 1.5. So, any comments or thoughts on that? Uh, yes, uh, we we know a lot from the continuous flow PD uh, literature, uh, which uh, is is very short lived in patients, may, maybe hours. But in models, uh, if if you expose the peritoneum to even uh, dextrose concentrations of uh, 500 uh, milligrams per dl, so 0.5 percent, uh, you will get ultrafiltration. The The reason the, the solutions we're using in PD are 1.5, 2.5 is because there'll be absorption without replacement of the dextrose, which is exactly the problem that uh, Russ is referring to here. Uh, but we do know that if the, if the concentration uh, were constantly at even as little as 0.5%, there would be a uh, quite positive ultrafiltration. And we know that from, again, from the continuous flow PD literature. Does that help answer what you're asking, uh, Osama? Yeah, and then what would be the way to mitigate that effect? Is it a flow problem? Is it about uh, the, 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 kind no, of how no. the fusion rates? 
No, I think it's the administration of the dextrose. Uh, and that that's exactly the problem that they were having is they have to replenish the used dextrose and they have to do it in a predictable way. And I, I think that's what they're currently working on and the degassing that that Russ talked about, because I know I know this group uh, and Russ, when you quoted Lee from UCLA, he, he's involved with this group, even though he's not an author on the paper. But but that's what they're working on is the the replenishment of glucose and some of the other electrolytes, I believe it might have been magnesium and 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 uh, and the degassing. Those are still existing problems. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. And then um, I know that uh, you know when we're discussing more biocompatible uh, PD fluids, right? Uh, we don't we don't really use them i mean i i don't know if we can if we even have access to them over here in the, in the us i know that we mentioned it before in uh, prior journal clubs um but i wasn't too surprised about the fact that the bicarbonate level was not higher in the uh, in the patients uh, who we used the awoc compared to uh, those who didn't uh, i mean i mean it's. I think the the you would expect to see a bigger effect, maybe if it was like above the normal or closer to the normal range. But I mean, I don't know what your thoughts on that, Dr. Gopher, or anybody in the uh, in the group. I, I didn't have any thoughts on that. Uh, so sorry. I I don't think the the bicarb is the issue. Uh, I think I do think you have to degas it though because. Uh, as you know, if there's excess CO2 in the system, CO2 uh, has got to do something. And and uh, uh, so CO2 and water, uh, there's a mild dissociation into, uh, as you know, bicarbonate and uh, hydrogen ion. But then any thoughts about uh, the uh, longevity of uh, peritoneal membranes with continuous exposure like this? over the long run so you know i know there's literature showing you know that that you can have more uf especially in the pediatric populations um with continuous pd but you know we we talk about the longevity of the membrane and the exposure to to the dextrose and the formation of advanced glycation end products um how how do we envision theoretically if somebody were on uh, continuous uh, PD like this, uh, how long their membrane would still be functional? Well, I'm going to come back to, again, the glucose concentration. I'd rather see, if it were my peritoneal membrane, I'd rather see a dextrose concentration of 0.5 continuously than intermittent concentrations of uh, 1.5, 2.5, or God forbid, four and a quarter even intermittently, because like it's, I, I'm quite worried about glycosylation of structural proteins more so even than AGEs. And uh, AGEs are important. I agree with that, Osama, but glycosylation of structural proteins occurs, it's concentration dependent and obviously time dependent, but I would rather be exposed to 500 of glucose constantly than intermittent uh, uh, levels of 1.5, 2.5, and four and a quarter. That's, I don't know that anybody's ever done that work, uh, but my personal feeling would be to leave the glucose lower. Uh, can I ask a few questions about uh, uh, middle molecules? Is that okay, Osama? Are we ready to stay with yeah, science? And, all right, so R Russell, in your uh, introduction, you had you were talking about the nomenclature. Uh, let me update you on the nomenclature. And Osama is quite up on this since he just wrote the NEFSAP for hemodialysis. But the it, the so middle molecules are roughly uh, uh, 500 to say the size of albumin or just below that. Those are considered middle, middle molecules. Uh, the nomenclature has slightly changed. And so they now call small middle 500 to 5,000 and then larger middle 
5,000 all the way up to, to just below albumin. And let me tell you why those nomenclatures are relevant is, uh, and Russell, you also said this in your introduction, is that that hemodialysis is is not very good at removing middle molecules. Well, that that's true until until now. Uh, one is there are newer membranes coming out. They're called MCO uh, medium cutoff membranes. Uh, and I, I won't go into the commercial aspects of that right now. And then uh, in Europe, there's hemodiafiltration. Uh, and both uh, those median cutoff membranes for hemodialysis and hemodiafiltration are substantially removing uh, uh, even what we call larger middle molecules. And so uh, uh, high flux uh, dialysis membranes uh, certainly are removing molecules probably you know, close to 15,000 Daltons. And you had mentioned uh, protein binding. Remember, uh, the binding is always in equilibrium. So there is that that's bound, and then there's free. And if you remove free, then that equilibrium is going to shift towards the, the right. Uh, so uh, uh, so time is an important factor uh, with regards to uh, uh, unbinding uh, protein-bound uh, toxins. And then these uh, newer membranes and newer techniques are going to uh, affect the size of the molecules cleared just to kind of catch everybody up on, on that science. Yeah, thank you. I, I never heard about MCO membranes. So I'm, I'm looking about it now. It's going to become really important in the next few years. And by the way, uh, and Osama, I actually contacted uh, one of the companies that makes one of these membranes. And, and then I talked to the the dialysis unit there at Vandy, and it, it, it was less than 50, 50 cents a dialyzer to the uh, to the MCO membranes that that Osama knows about. He we he's asked us not to mention commercial products, but but he knows about it, and uh, it's about 50 cents or less per dialyzer than what we're paying for those uh, uh, 180s. Thank you so much, Tom. It's, these are, uh, you know, great points, and yeah, I, I know exactly which one you're talking about. Um, and then, Russell, do you mind pulling up the slide real quick that shows the composition uh, of the fluid compared to the dianeal that we use? Oh yeah, yeah, from the old study. Yeah. Yeah. This is a this is an ex vivo, but yeah. Okay, do we know if we, they use the same solution, the same dialysate for everybody? So I don't know if they use this same one um, that's here. That's a good question. Um, wow, I, I guess I didn't pay attention to this, but uh, look at that sodium concentration. Yeah. And uh, so, so let's talk a little bit about sodium movement for just a second, okay? Uh, so. Help, help me, uh, Russell. Do you do you remember from chemistry the Gibbs Donnan effect? I do not. <laughs> okay, so that's okay. So uh, if if you've got uh, a membrane that should let uh, ions through, uh, uh, if you put something on the membrane that prevents an ion from getting through, then that hinders the ion getting through. And so uh, albumin is uh, got multiple negative charges. And albumin piles up against the uh, the membrane uh, in hemodialysis, okay? And uh, it's also, it, it's, it's, if there's aggressive ultrafiltration, uh, it will pile up against the membrane in, uh, in the peritoneal capillaries. I don't know that there's aggressive ultrafiltration, but but there could be. And, but let's take hemo for a minute. If you if I dialyze somebody against a sodium bath of uh, 140 versus 132, uh, uh, I'm not going to remove nearly as much sodium. Granted, 80% uh, of sodium is removed by ultrafiltration because the sodium concentration of the ultrafiltrate is equal to plasma water, but there's still some diffusion. Uh, 
And even in PD, there is necessary, uh, you need a, a, uh, uh, a concentration gradient. And so as dextrose opens, stimulates the opening of aquaporins, you're diluting the concentration of sodium in the dialysate. The, the naturally occurring, which is here. But but, but look at this, the, the dianeal has a sodium concentration of 132 in the dialysate, which, which enhances the diffusion gradient from sodium from blood to dialysate. And they've sort of sabotaged themselves here. I'm wondering why their sodium uh, uh, in the regenerated is not as low as it is in dianeal. Was, yeah. I didn't read this paper uh, yeah, carefully I wonder, enough. To, yeah, I wonder if it's because um, they use sodium as a lot of um, the exchangers for for like the um, high, for um, not hydrogen for um, uh, the degassing part. I think they're using sodium to exchange with with a lot of the other protons. So I don't know if that's the reason why sodium was higher in the regeneration part. I, mean, I, 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 didn't, I didn't finish the gibbs donnan effect. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to finish it. It, it. It's important in hemo. It's not, not in PD, but in hemo, you guys understand that uh, you're piling up albumin against the on the on the blood side, right up against the membrane, and those charges of albumin uh, retard sodium coming through that membrane. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you guys should understand that that uh, and that retardation of of it balances out pretty much equal to uh, the the plasma water sodium concentration is about 155, whereas your your whole blood or your plasma is is measuring 140. That's because plasma is seven percent protein. But just coming back to the chemistry. That gibbs donnan effect pretty much balance, uh, 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 wipes out that difference between uh, plasma water sodium and plasma sodium concentration. Uh, but but re you retard sodium uh, movement through the membrane uh, uh, via, via diffusion by the uh, negative charges on albumin piled up against the membrane. And just again, to, to understand the term, that's called protein concentration polarization, where the protein is banging up against the membrane on the blood side with all those negative charges. And by the way, that's the same thing true for the movement of other ions. Uh, calcium is retarded because it's positive, and bicarbonate is actually extruded because of the negative charges. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Dr. Golper. Now, could this uh, could this most likely then uh, have contributed to the ultrafiltration um, uh, changes that we saw? This potentially, uh, I mean, what we know that PD patients uh, tend to be uh, at times are kind of on the lower uh, sodium uh, serum sodium concentration, and could could we could they have potentially been sodium loading these patients? Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I guess that would affect like things like sodium sieving and things like that, the peritoneal membrane, right? Um, yep, yeah. but but weren't those patients with residual kidney function doing the best in that regard? So it kind of in, in implies that Osama's theory is correct. Right, yeah. Because because then one would assume. I mean, did they comment on um, what their uh, what their fluid intake was during that time? Because what if they, were they didn't have any thirsty? Yeah, that was a big right? big issue. Yeah, this I think they're planning to address that in the late feasibility study. But this study, they didn't have any strict eyes and nose or anything. So we don't know what how much fluid they they took in or anything. Yeah. And, and because if, if they, I they were going to repeat this, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, if I'm going to repeat the studies, I would do time studies and I would do the same patient uh, a day using this and then a day without and, and control, exactly control 
uh, food intake. And that's yeah. how I would look at uh, urea because you, on a day-to-day -day basis, unless you eat your, change your diet or change your catabolic state, your urea generation is going to be the same. And and I agree with you, Russ, this is the, the measuring urea in the uh, effluent is a mess. They're, they're, they're not going to succeed with that. The only way they're going to look at it is total body urea before and after the treatment, and they'll have to compare it to a uh, uh, a non-treatment, no PD, no nothing, same diet, same level of fasting if they're fasting, and look at urea generation on the day they don't apply this, and the, and and then when they do apply this, and if and then go from the uh, difference in the urea levels. That is how you'd have to just by the process of elimination determine urea removal by this device. Yeah, yeah. I didn't look into what they're doing the late feasibility study, but um, I wonder if that's what they're planning to do too. I'll have to look at the protocol for it. So, sorry. So, I know we're kind of running low on time, but shifting gears uh, real quick to uh, the practical side of things. So, when it says that it's uh, that the patient gets about what two liters, you said um, of of dialysate per. Or, yeah. What was the rate again? Two liters per hour continuously. Two liters per hour continuously. So I'm assuming that the rate at which it's going in, right? Let's say like, you know, per minute, right? Mm -hmm. Would be 2000 divided by 60. And that's constant then throughout. Yeah, that, that would be the assumption if there's no device dysfunction. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because then I wonder, I wonder like then what happens if there's device dysfunction, does it make it up? Uh, or does it is it just set like that? And and how do they get? I mean, Dr. Goldberg, you're more familiar with these studies about continuous PD. Uh, how do you get to that two liter uh, mark? How is that decided on? And and shouldn't it vary depending on the size of the patient? Because we would assume the peritoneal membrane size would differ. I'm not sure what you meant by the two liter mark. Uh, I think they're they're not they don't have two liters in the belly at any one time. No, no. Is what that, I'm saying is why what why would you pick two liters per hour as the amount of fluid that you're putting in the membrane? Like, how do you decide, or how does one decide on on the amount that goes into the uh, the membrane when you're prescribing continuous PD? Is that just the standard or uh, no, no the, well, prices. well, I, I, I don't know about standard, uh, Osama. There are models. There are models that that are suggesting, uh, uh, you know, forty to fifty liters a day. And so, if you divide that out, that that comes out. That, that's pretty close to the same. They may have used those models. I I don't know. But uh, by the way, if anybody wants those models, just send me an email and I'll send the models to you. There there are at least two or three papers on it. Some quite recent. And then they did talk about uh, having to change the cartridge every seven hours, right? So that three cartridges a day, twenty one a week. Sorry, it's raining over here. That's why I uh, really hear this. But it's uh, 21 a week, which means in a month, right? You're using uh, 84 cartridges. I mean, yeah. how is that cost wise as well, right? We're talking about cutting Good costs. Good question. And I, yeah. And I didn't, like, I didn't like the fact that when they were comparing, they were comparing themselves to in center HD, right? right? Those numbers and the advantages, cost savings. They're comparing to in-center, not to other PD. Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't look up at the cost of how much each cartridge and the components of the cartridge itself, too, um, how much they, they cost. So it's a, it's a good question that you bring up that I didn't really think about. Dr. Golfer, any thoughts on that? That's going to be very frustrating to everybody, and it's same thing true with the the WAC. Uh, even in the WAC, uh, uh, we're talking about changing the cartridges every night. So uh, the uh, I, I don't think there's I mean, a solution to that. Once a night, once a yeah, night compared to every, every night. seven hours. No, but I'm talking about if you compare this to every seven hours, right? You hook yourself up. You got to if you're going to work. 
with this, you got to take spare cartridges with you, right? I mean, I don't know about the practicality. <laughs> Yeah, and the battery packs and everything too. Yeah. Well, so that that's why with the WAC, which is Hemo, Russell, it's the it's the Hemo side, and uh, uh, the 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 cartridge part was to be done at night, Osama. So it would be eight hours. But remember, those are not wearable. The cartridges are not wearable. That could be a much bigger, and the larger the sorbent package, the less often it would have to be changed but it would still need to be changed nightly uh even for that and so the the hemo wearable that is being postulated right now is at night there is the major major solute removal while they're sleeping uh with a large with a, a hookup to the larger packs and during the day it's just running the dialysate over carbon and, and then ultra filtering. So uh, there's a both of these, whether it's hemo or peritoneal, have got a long ways to go. Uh, and and the 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 microization, the the miniaturization, uh, all that is a big issue. And now you're pointing out that sorbents uh, can't be compacted. If you compact them, you reduce the surface area. And the whole success of the sorbents is surface area. So you can't compact them too much. Right. So, uh, Um, and then, and then, uh, two very quick points. I know we're we're over time. Uh, one is, did they mention uh, Russell? Uh, how like with a full charge, how long does the battery last? I did not get that, but they did recommend carrying at least a spare battery pack. Um, okay. And then, and then, what were the dimensions again? So it was around around two kilograms, and if I pull up the picture, you probably could get the dimensions better out of that. <laughs> so it's about, I guess, torso sized, the pack itself. Yeah, it kind of looks like you're walking around with a CITES. Except <laughs> for it's not float, it's just like, you know, like. I mean, that's the packaging uh -huh. of it. I think the actual thing, um, this is from, the AWOC image itself, the orange, the orange little thing. But if you put it in the package, like the, the holder, I guess, the binder. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, Dr. Goldberg, any last uh, thoughts before we wrap up? Nope. Thanks for including me. Yeah. All right, of course. All right, Russell. Well, thank you so much for uh, a great presentation. Um, I always, you know, think it's important for us to talk about topics that are interesting to the fellows as well as the rest of us. You know, this is a technology that is definitely worth pursuing and discussing uh, more. And that's why I was, you know, when you brought it up, I wanted us to talk about it because that's the direction that we're moving, I think, um, yeah. in dialysis as a whole. So great discussion. And uh, stay tuned, everybody, for next month's uh, Central Time Zone ISPD Journal Club. Awesome. Thank you for facilitating, Dr. Alshami. All right. Absolutely. All right. Take care. All.